Okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, good evening from uh, New York City. It's a beautiful spring day here. Uh, you can hear people cheering for the healthcare workers outside my window. Uh, we have our sixth session today. We are very pleased to have the leadership of the endocrine section joining us uh, for a very lively discussion of uh, thyroid cancer. Very pleased to have Dr. Greg Randolph, Dr. Randall Stack, Dr. Michael Moore, Dr. Jeffrey Liu, and Dr. Alshan Zahn, uh, our um, neuroradiologist, to discuss the cases. We're going to have something new this time. We have one of our fellows, Dr. Randolph, fellows, Dr. Uvala, uh, presenting one of the cases. So hopefully it would be a good tradition moving forward. <laughs> Without further ado, we have a full schedule. Let's just start. I am going to present the first case. Uh, let's see. You guys can see my, my screen? Okay, so the first case is a 52-year-old healthy woman who actually was at her gynecologist and the gynecologist noticed the thyroid nodule and ordered an ultrasound. Uh, and then she came to me uh, on physical exam. She had a two to three three centimeter side, right thyroid nodule, mobile, non-tender. The rest of her exam was normal. She was quite healthy. She had no radiation exposure, no family history of endocrine disease, no other risk factors. And as you all know, once we have a thyroid nodule, the next step would be thyroid function test and an ultrasound. And I'll have uh, Dr. Zahn uh, describe the ultrasound for you. Uh, Elston, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, so I will share my screen. Hi, everyone. Elton Zan here. So I will be showing the nodule itself. We won't be going through the entire thyroid ultrasound. But the reason we are doing the thyroid ultrasound, at least from a radiology perspective, is to provide you... Um, an action stratification. Beyond describing the features, we used a standardized um, uh, protocol approved by American College of Radiology called TIRETS. So for uh, familiarity, TIRETS comes up with a, with a score at the end, which Dr. Givey will show, I think, soon after me. And per this, per this score, um, we are providing you as uh, action stratification about what to tell to the patient, yes, you have a five centimeter nodule, but don't worry about it, or one centimeter nodule, probably you should worry about it. So we're looking at, this is the uh, right thyroid nodule on transverse plane, and I'm going to over the imaging features on transverse plane itself. So we're talking about composition. Is this a solid or a uh, cystic nodule? As we can see here, it is a solid nodule. What about the margins? We can see very well defined margins. You can see this dark line between the thyroid nodule and the thyroid gland itself. However, we don't really appreciate the margins posteriorly, but this may be just because of the attenuation of our sound waves uh, from coming from the ultrasound probe. So for now, we will consider this as solid, well-defined uh, nodule. Epigenicity is another feature. This is purely hyperechoic and shape. So shape needs to be um, evaluated on transverse plane, as you see here. We're talking about is the nodule, I'm measuring it here, but you don't see it because, all right. So the shape, we are evaluating shape, um, whether on oh, transverse plane, is it smaller and wider? This is the most significant risk factor for any thyroid nodule, any taller than wider nodule. But for this one, it looks pretty spherical could be taller than wider on a different cut. It looks pretty spherical, but we need to find the largest, right, on this cut. It looks taller than wider, which is suspicious. And do we see any hyperechoic foci, uh, which represents microcalcifications commonly seen in uh, papillary thyroid? We don't see any here. And after evaluating those five features, composition, margin, 
echogenicity shape and echogenic foci, we um, identify a number and report it, and Dr. Gimme will be taking over from here. Alison, there is a question from the group. Is, do you call this isoechoic or? This, uh, so this is compared to the muscle mm -hmm. and it is hyperechoic. Okay. Do you compare it to the muscle or do you compare it to the rest of the thyroid? We compare it to the muscle. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. If you stop. All right, so at this point, any comments? Uh, Greg, uh, Brandon, uh, Mike, Jeff? Uh, this is Brendan Stack here. Um, I think your case uh, really demonstrates a common phenomena, especially if you're in a focused <laughs> endocrine surgical practice. Uh, we can't forget that we need to educate uh, our frequent referrers, which would be general family medicine, internal medicine, but in many cases, OBGYNs are the primary care of our female patients. And so it was very astute of that gynecologist to go ahead and proceed with the ultrasound, identify the patient has an issue, and then make that referral. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, so this is the, the summary of the ultrasound. As you can see, it's about a four centimeter nodule. It's solid, it's echogenic, it's uh, hyperechoic or isoechoic, it's wider than tall, uh, with, which we didn't see it in the lab. And the TIRAS score for this particular nodule was TIRAS three, three points, which is, makes it mildly suspicious. And the recommendation at this time is to FNA if it's more than two and a half centimeters. And see if it's I think at this point, everybody agrees that FNA is indicated and we, we would recommend that. Anybody have any objections? Yeah, this is, uh, may I ask a question uh, just to yeah. throw a little controversy. What happens, this is Greg Randolph, uh, what happens if the patient says, well, you know, there's this big lump in my neck and I'm here to have you take it out. Uh, it's big enough that I feel it as a lump and so I would like it out. And if you are willing to take it out, then the patient says, why do I need to have a needle biopsy then if you're gonna take it out anyway? That's a great question. Um, I, can I mean, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not a question that fits in with our set you know, procedural workup, but it is not an unreasonable question for the patient to ask. I, I completely agree. Yeah. Basically, my answer to them is, you know, I'm a surgeon and I'm going to the places that I haven't been and I would like to have a roadmap. And part of my roadmap is what I'm dealing with. Am I dealing with cancer or am I not dealing with cancer? Especially in this case, which is almost a four centimeter nodule, According to the ATA guidelines, this is almost there for requiring the total thyroidectomy if it's cancer. Uh, so I personally would not operate on people whom I don't have a diagnosis if I'm doing a therapeutic operation, not a diagnostic operation. That's my philosophy. So, open for so to that. To, to that point, Babak, uh, and I totally agree with you, now that we're seeing more uh, possibility of ablation being used in the thyroid, I think that makes doing a fine needle aspiration even more compelling so that people aren't misguided with the new technology and say, oh, I've got this large lesion, it's got a, uh, a low thyroid score, and the patient is being bothered by mass effect or cosmesis, I'll just go burn it out without knowing what the cytopathology is. Yeah. Yeah, there's I, one, I, there's one uh, also that, that it's a healthy discussion, though, back and forth with the patient, uh, because sometimes patients are thinking, I just want to get out of this office, and I want this to be behind, and I want this to be in the rearview mirror, and I don't want to deal with any of this, and I certainly don't want to think about cancer. And while we're looking at this with Elson's really erudite review of that ultrasound and saying, you know, it's probably going to be okay, but there is a risk of malignancy. That is in our head. And in some patients, they are not wanting to think about that. No. So for me, no. this is an opportunity for me to talk to the patient and say, the reason I would like a needle biopsy is something that you may not want to really hear about. But it's not that I wouldn't operate if it's benign but I would do more, as you said, Babic, 
if it's malignant. And the patient may really be wanting purposely to be biased and not be thinking about that. But as you present that information, you match your agenda with the patient's agenda, which is healthy. Patient may not like it right off the bat, mentioning the possibility of malignancy, but you're thinking that, and things overall go better if you and the patient are all thinking on the same plane. I completely agree. Let me um, welcome Dr. Uh, Greg Farwell and Arno. I thought that they just joined. Greg and Arno, welcome. Uh, really uh, love to have you, and please, uh, you know, make comments as we go forward for the case. Okay, we have a full agenda, so. Let's say the patient is reasonable and would want to do the biopsy. So we did the biopsy. The FNA was, as you can see, it was a follicular lesion of undetermined significance. Did have multiple oncocytes with heterosal type. And uh, this was reviewed uh, with our cytopathologist. Uh, the specimen was a cellular, almost exclusively heterosal cells in cluster uh, without significant colloidal lymphocytes. The patient had the tyrosic done that was read, as you can see, I specifically put the entire description here for you. Positive 60% risk of malignancy, but if you read the, the detail, it says no point mutation or gene fusion was found. A multiple chromosomal copy number alterations were identified. Associated with probability of cancer, typically follicular pattern carcinoma, including hurdle cell. So, open for discussion. What would you do, what would you recommend? Let's just start from the West Coast this time. Uh, Dr. Farwell, Greg, and uh, Arno, what would you recommend? I would defer to my colleague, Dr. Buley, but I would be inclined to uh, do a hemithyroidectomy. Okay, very good. Arno? Sorry, I'm going to pass. I just had to step away, so I'm coming right No worries, back. no worries. Okay. Uh, you know, Abic, let me ask a question. If you would operate on this patient, uh, and you would do a hemithyroidectomy, what would you describe to the patient? How do you interpret this molecular change and this needle biopsy? When the patient says, so I don't know what Bethesda is, I don't know what copy yeah. number is, what is this, Dr. Givney? So I, I have my, my regular uh, talk to them that I always say, I'm a cancer surgeon, I operate for cancer. If you don't have cancer, you should not have a cancer operation. For my, in my mind, this is not a proven cancer. We don't know what it is. The ultrasound, especially the reason I picked this case because of the ultrasound. But with that ultrasound and with the fact that there are no high-risk mutations, and I showed a paper that shows you that herzl cell carcinoma are different. Herzl cell in general is locally invasive. I don't see any evidence of local invasion. In my mind, we don't have a diagnosis. I, I am doing a diagnostic procedure. A diagnostic procedure is hemithyroidectomy. And I have a line that I tell all of my, my patients. I say, there are 100 surgeons in New York City who can take your thyroid out. Last time I checked, nobody can put it back in once it's out. So <laughs> let me just remove half of it. I think it's Jeff. I have a side comment there briefly is, you know, at a tertiary referral centers, we will often see patients who are referred in and already have a gene expression classifier performed. And so that it gets folded into our decision-making process. But I do want to point out as a matter of um, process that I try to avoid any reflex testing of indeterminate nodules and try to at least intervene with a discussion for the patients because I, don't, I think the right place for gene expression classifiers is after the patient has had a discussion of what an indeterminate nodule means and what the gene expression classifier can do. So I think it's some places I feel like or physicians who will work up patients and then refer often seem to reflex that test, but I think it's important that patients understand that sometimes they don't need a gene expression classifier if they feel strongly one way or another. Some patients feel that 50-50, they still wouldn't want the surgery and would prefer observation if the risk profile seems appropriate. And conversely, there are some patients like, hey, 50-50 is more than zero and I want the operation no matter what. So in, in some cases, a gene expression classifier is not necessary to make a final decision on the patient after you've discussed that yeah. discussion. I, I complete, I'm sorry if I'm rushing a little bit because as sure. I said, we have only 20 minutes for each case and the, the other two cases are much more interesting, but I completely agree with you. And I would explain to the audience that the decision to do genetic <laughs> testing is like any other decision for a diagnostic test. It has to be done based on the entire data, entire imaging and the information. There. And that's what we do here. We always, when our pathologists make the diagnosis, they discuss with us, and then we will make a decision if it needs to be sent for virus. One thing I would just say is that it's, it's good to talk with the patient and share how you regard this. So when I would talk with the patient with all of this data, I would say, so 
Could this end up being benign when we take it out? Yes, it could. Could it end up being malignant? Yes, it could. Could it end up being pre-malignant? Yes, it could. You know, that they have to understand that those molecular changes are far enough upstream that it may not necessarily be morphologically malignant at the time we are taking it out. The patients, you know, at, you'd think a patient would run out of the room and saying, Dr. Randolph, you don't know what you're doing. You don't have any clue. After all of this money and needle biopsies, you don't know what's going on. I'm going to go see someone else. But they really do understand when you explain molecular changes and how they are upstream to the morphologic derangement that we see under the microscope of malignancy, they get that. And I think they appreciate that there are these options. And then it's a lot easier postoperatively. The visits are shorter and more congratulatory, given that you've predicted every possible outcome. So you can't be wrong on the postoperative visit, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, so seems like uh, in spite of my efforts, we don't have that much of a controversy here among us. Anybody would recommend a total thyroidectomy at this point? Um, Micah, you haven't spoken yet. I'm Brandon. No, I think this approach seems very reasonable. Obviously, some patients, you know, have a strong preference one way or the other. If it were over four centimeters, then it would be, I think, a little bit different discussion, um, you know, because then, you know, to save them the potential need for a second operation. Uh, but this one, even if it did stay under four, even if it were malignant, you could consider, you know, just the uh, observation and leaving the other half. And Brandon, you would do the... And I think... And I, I, I would do the HEMI. I think yeah. to Greg's point, though, if you've mapped out all these possibilities in the unlikely event that you need to go do a completion thyroidectomy for the purposes of postoperative radioactive iodine administration, then you've already set the stage. You're not going to have an angry, uh, distrustful patient. They're going to understand what's going on. But I think one of the best things that we can do for surgeons is not hurt our patients. And that obviously seems ridiculously obvious. But by doing a HEMI, and in most cases in this situation, not doing the total, we've taken bilateral vocal cord paralysis and permanent hypoparathyroidism off the table. And that is a huge quality of life service that we're doing for our patients. Okay, very good. Thank you. So I did the hemithyroidectomy and it came back uh, Sorry, let me go back. As a for as usual, as you know the case, you always find a six, four or five millimeter, six millimeter. In this case, a microcarcinoma. It was it turned out to be a herzofladenoma with 3.5 centimeter completely excised. Did have a hypoplastic nodule next to it, and our pathologists are quite obsessive compulsive here. And then they looked at the entire adenoma and showed in individual cells. Apoptosis, no necrosis, mitosis, significant solid area, nothing else. So anybody else would do anything more? We have to wrap this case up in min one minute. Nope. Okay, so just a point for the our fellows. One thing that really helped me in this conversation was the papers from Memorial that uh, Ian Ganley published the genomic di dissection of herzosal carcinoma. And I just brought this last piece that the herzosal carcinomas have a high number of disruptive mutation to uh, both protein coding and here. And the fact that we didn't have any point mutation here, no fusion, it really helped me to also more be convinced that this is probably a benign even before doing it. Um, and as, I, as everybody is much more elegantly discussed today that, you know, it's not cancer and it's cancer. Don't get worked up about the herzl cell or all these things and look at the clinical behavior, look at the imaging characteristics and make the decision based on the entire picture, not just one or two points of data. Any last comments on this case? Any of the faculty? Do the fellows have any questions, any comments? Okay, very good. Let's go to a different case. So the next one is, this is a case at Bellevue. It's a 60, sorry, 46 year old man, manual labor from Guatemala originally. He was presented to ER with wheezing and strider, was admitted to ICU and then we were consulted. 
Before that, he was completely healthy, although I found out that he has been coming to the pulmonary clinic for the past few months complaining of shortness of breath, and he was being treated for asthma, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> he didn't have any radiation exposure, no family history of endocrine. When we examined him the first time, he had a very hard thyroid mass, barely mobile. He didn't have any lateral neck mass. Interestingly, his voice was okay, and when we scoped him, we couldn't see anything above the cords, and the cords were both working. Um, but there was a little bit of a meaty thing below, uh, suspicious kind of below the cord. And I'm going to stop sharing and uh, show you the CT scan. Okay, Elchin, you're up. We are up to 40 people and call that. Pretty good. So let me share the screen. All right. So we are looking at the baseline scan. It's a contrast enhanced next CT. And I purposefully normally in the radiology work, we do rely heavily on axial pictures, but I purposefully put the sagittal and the coronal pictures because we cannot emphasize enough. If you want to see three-dimensional relationship of any mass, you have to be in full charge of axial, sag, and coronal pictures. So, as you can see here, we will start with this. Uh, okay, where are my arrows? So we're looking at a um, large mass. I don't like using large or small in terms of, I like using numbers, but we're looking at a thyroid mass. Let me show you the normal, the only residual normal appearing thyroid tissue on the right. We're looking at a thyroid mass, re completely replacing the left thyroid lobe, isthmus, and hugging the trachea, and not only hugging, crossing through the trachea anteriorly. So this feature already makes it high risk in terms of an aplastic thyroid carcinoma, but this amount of calcification would not be typical for it. And on the other hand, we don't see that very often. We do not know what it means, but in terms of the case classification image description, this is a partially calcified, large mass encasing the trachea, going through the trachea, inseparable from the esophagus. In terms of the vessels, we rely on this dark um, density, like gray density between the mass and the vessels. But you can see the vessels much better on this coronal picture. The fat plane between the vessel carotid and the mass is overall and circumferentially preserved. Its relationship to the innominate artery here, it's, there is a clear fat plane. But only at this point on axial, it's really hard to tell whether it touches the carotid or not. Its relationship to the esophagus, when we go up, coming down from the hypopharynx, now it just became the esophagus here. It's completely inseparable from it, maybe infiltrating it. We can't really tell because we are losing the entire tissue plane here. And this picture is unfortunately highly concerning for prevertebral muscle infiltration because this fat, as you come down, is lost here, concerning for prevertebral muscle base <coughs> infiltration. In terms of the nodes, surprising enough, there are no abnormal nodes. But if we're talking about papillary thyroid cancer, even this tiny node needs to be evaluated with ultrasound because size does not matter in papillary thyroid cancer or lymphadenopathy. And I do have a post-operative picture, Babak, would you like me to show it right now? Or? Uh, why did you... Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. okay, I'll show it later. Don't spoil it. <laughs> Don't spoil it now. Okay. Um, okay. Let me have the screen back. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I mean, we're going to dedicate most of the discussion for the rest. Part. So this patient was in the ICU, and my resident called me and said, uh, what would you like us to do? And I said, oh, this is definitely anaplastic. Just get a biopsy and prove, and then send to uh, RT and chemo RT. And um, uh, Elshin, can you stop uh, sharing your screen for a second? Mm -hmm. So I, I, we did that. and. Uh, First biopsy, to our surprise, the FNA came back as a well differentiated thyroid cancer. No anaplastic, no poorly differentiated. And I said, you guys got the, the right thing. We did the same thing, well differentiated, no anaplastic. 
because of his uh, breathing problem, we actually took him to the OR uh, with one of our laryngologists and did an intra tracheal debulking and send this. And this is the trachea, as you can see, this is right below the uh, cricoid. And this posterior, this is all tumor in the trachea. So we suctioned all that tumor, uh, micro it, and um, sent now this time good chunk biopsy from the most aggressive part of it. So this is all this meaty stuff that you see, this is all tumor. That also came back as well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma. No necrosis, nothing else. We reviewed it at Bellevue, at NYU, everything. I don't remember if we did BRAF or not, but here's the situation. What would you do? So let's start this time from East Coast. Jeff? Thank you, Bobak. Very interesting case. Um, I think one of the key elements here is a really good history and physical. Understandably, the patient may not be the greatest historian, but individuals who come from other countries who may have not had good access to care may have had a longer time course of a mass being present. So if this thing had been pet present for 15 years compared to if he had no mass and literally blew up in the last six to eight months, that's a very key piece of history that could help better inform the diagnosis. Um, and so from the information that I'm getting and some of the comments by Elson, which were excellent about there being a lot of calcification, which is not what we typically see with anaplastic unless it's developed in a previously existing long-standing papillary or in a thyroid goiter, um, you kind of have to go with the diagnosis that you have. I would do a metastatic workup first, including the chest, to make sure we're not missing anything. There's not disease elsewhere. And then what we're looking at is a local regionally advanced thyroid cancer with an invasion into the trachea and at least the party wall and likely the esophagus. I don't know if you did an esophagoscopy at that time. And the airways. We did. No, okay. No luminal tumor. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I would favor, um, if, if the cancer is only local regionally advanced, I would favor a uh, complete resection of the tumor, which likely require laryngectomy and trachea tracheectomy with partial uh, resection. Tracheal resection, thanks, sorry. <laughs> and possible, you know, pharyngectomy or esophagectomy as necessary in, within the cervical esophagus and reconstruction and an appropriate neck dissection, at least ipsilateral, um, although I'd have to study the scan a little bit more. Sure. Um, that's a lot of information in a short bite of sound. Okay. Um, I would ask uh, Michael and then we ask, uh, Mike, what would you do? Uh, well, I mean, I think not a great non-surgical option um, in this instance, and I think in the absence of florid distant metastatic disease, uh, I think uh, the surgery Jeff mentioned would be very appropriate. Uh, was there a wiggle from the spine when you examined them? Barely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you would have to prepare for, I would probably get thoracics involved about the potential need mm -hmm. for a formal esophageal reconstruction. Hopefully you could get access above the thoracic inlet to rebuild the esophagus um, with a tubed flap, but uh, certainly the potential that you'd need to do a complete esophagectomy just depending on their anatomy. Um, you know, likely you'd, in that instance, have to take the prevertebral fascia, but, you know, and obviously you're very high risk for some residual microscopic disease, but I think in the context of the biology is probably uh, the most appropriate. And again, I agree with, you know, addressing the neck looks like clinically probably in zero based on the images we saw, but at a minimum do a, uh, you know, a formal central neck and probably would, you know, consider, you know, that left lateral neck just given sure. the circumstances and not ever wanting to go in there again. Okay. Uh, Brandon, Greg, and uh, Greg. So I think Jeff gave a great comprehensive answer and I think that would be the safe test question answer. That would be the board answer. Just to be a bit of a provocateur, I will tell you that I've had experience with these locally advanced cancers that appear to present like they're an anaplastic, but you can never prove they're an anaplastic. So they're just a very locally, regionally aggressive, differentiated thyroid cancer. And um, I have both seen these people on the front end and seen these people halfway through their treatment, i.e. Uh, somebody else took care of them initially. And uh, where I'm going to be a provocateur is the possibility of trying to preserve the larynx, give external beam radiation and radioactive iodine, and then just like we sometimes will stage a thyroid operation as it relates to a loss of intraoperative nerve signal, sort of using a similar rationale to staging the surgery up to, but not total laryngectomy, 
and then holding that in reserve. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Dr. Farvo, Dr. Randolph. I certainly don't have much to add, but at the beginning of this case, I would send a very large incisional biopsy. And <laughs> just kind of get an idea, you know, the old fashioned peak and shriek, see what the prevertebral fascia looks like, send a big chunk of it off for an incisional biopsy. But otherwise, I agree completely with Jeff. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with everything that's been said, Greg and, and Mike and Jeff and, and Brendan. Uh, I, would, I would just say the uh, establishment of what sort of disease do we have distantly would be an important parameter so that you could, you know, phrase out this aggressive local treatment in the context of, you know, that you don't have some hyalur bulky lesion that's going to erode into the, into the hilum of the lung uh, soon. So I would, I would put that on the plate too. And also this is, we all see this, you know, a laryngectomy as the first procedure for a thyroid cancer, but it's unusual. And so uh, there's something that's got this tumor's back up. So to include uh, molecular analysis of this tumor yeah. would be useful for sure in the future, if not now, and to involve your oncology colleagues that are focused on thyroid TKIs and so forth would be appropriate now. I think that those are great points. Thank you. So the CT which just was negative, uh, just to let you guys know. And I agree with you. This was a few years back. Nowadays, if I see this, I will definitely test for BRAF and I would significantly consider uh, BRAF inhibitors first. Uh, and, you know, the data coming from MD Anderson is pretty interesting that they, these folks, they, when you, if they get a response to BRAF, they use it as a window of opportunity to shrink the tumor and maybe try to save the larynx and others. But so you know, the, the, it's a very peculiar response to that's anaplastic BRAF has a response. And in, in those tumors, the remaining tumor that's viable in the resected specimens is the papillary. Mm -hmm. which presumably should be BRAF also. So it, uh, there, I mean, it would certainly be worth a multidisciplinary discussion, but BRAF papillary may not succumb to the combination therapy that BRAF anaplastic does. I have, I have a point. question for our co-discussants. Yeah. Would anybody get a PET scan preoperatively before surgery, um, not because of just a metastasis, but more to understand the biology of the tumor? I think sometimes with these locally aggressive tumors, having a pet, very heavily pet avid lesion suggests that you're less likely to be RAI avid and can help sort of um, prognosticate the tumor and also make decisions about um, external beam versus REI as your next step post surgery. I think it's a really, a really good point. Uh, in general, the grade of the tumor and where the gross disease is left it are the things in my practice that put radiation above RAI. Uh, so even BRAF positive, even PET positive, uh, you're still obliged to run the patient by RAI, and I would push towards that. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure that I would find the PET. Um, I mean, you will get pushback from endocrine about uh, radiating first or giving RAI if you have a BRAF positive tumor, but this guy's going to need every bullet in your gun. Yeah. Robert, and I see a comment. Go ahead. Uh, before we go on, so I think it's uh, one thing we shouldn't gloss over is the airway management for this patient. Yeah. So be very thoughtful about whether or not to consider a tracheostomy. If you do a trach downstream of that and you're still considering surgery, it's going to really impact the length of the trachea that have to be removed. And uh, in your instance, it looked like you guys did a, a very, uh, you know, an excellent airway exam and then debulking and tried to minimize the need for any surgical airway in the acute setting. Um, but I think it'd be very easy to say, oh, let's just trach downstream of yeah. that. You can get yourself in a real pickle in a hurry. There wasn't on that sagittal view a lot of room between it and the you know, manubrium. Oh, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And again, in the interest of time, I'm going to push this forward. But you're absolutely right. And that was the decision that we made actually with our laryngologist that we are not going to trach this patient without a plan. And, and similar to what I think Dr. Shafi has on the line too, and Dr. Farvel, that what they said about the bi biopsy. And really, I got a lot of tumor out of the trachea, and we were satisfied with the amount of biopsy because, by definition, that's the most aggressive part of the tumor. You know, it's basically breaking through the trachea, it's inside the trachea. And when all that came back as uh, papillary, without any necrosis, without any anaplastic, I was uh, a little bit more reassured, but I, there's nothing wrong with as you said. So, 
in the interest of time, uh, I looked at it. I said, there's no way I'm going to offer it in this case. And then one of my residents, who is now a faculty at Rutgers, said, no, you should offer it. So I sent this uh, CT scan to a few people in the country. And they said, well, it's possible, but you have to con con uh, consent for laryngectomy. And so against my better judgment, I took the patient to the OR. Uh, I would tell you, anybody tells you that thyroid surgery is early nights and tennis, don't listen to them. It was a long day. We started basically between the carotid. I released the both carotid. There was not direct invasion. It was basically a solid chunk of tissue between the two carotids that you, you could not move this thing. And you had to go around it. And I, I found the nerve on the contralateral side to separate it. On the right side, I didn't even look for the nerve. And so we finally kind of mobilized this, got it out of the uh, musculature of the esophagus. And then we first took it out. And this is the specimen that you can see. It's completely going into the trachea with just invading the entire tracheoesophageal groove going into this coming out is all involved. I had to cut about six um, ring of esophagus that my positive margin on my margin on the cricoid was barely being negative but by the time I was done I had basically about six centimeters of trachea gone. I had a larynx with one nerve standing up top and I was still worried about this posterior margin going into the cricoid. So although I didn't have any gross tumor, I elected to take the, the, the larynx out. We took it out. Um, they told her injectomy, I didn't need to do a flap. I had enough uh, mucosa to close it primarily. He, he did have a relatively uncomplicated, because the only thing I, I couldn't see or I couldn't find was any, any resemblance of parathyroid. And he did become uh, hypoparathyroid afterward. However, he did okay. Um, then, there was, this was the final path. There was a papyrothyroid carcinoma, mixed classical and follicular, tarsal features, 7.5 centimeters. Interestingly, no lymphovascular invasion, no perineural invasion. Sorry, one more time, you saying? Extensive uh, 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 extracellular uh, expansion. Uh, there was one lymph node in that well, gigantic well, expression well, was negative. Yes. Margins were free, but no, I don't believe that because I'm sure there's this. And there was invasion of cycloid. Uh, we went on to get uh, RAI and followed by external beam. This was again about four years ago. And uh, I think, Elshin, you have a picture of post up? Mm -hmm. Yep, I do. I'm sure. uh, so while we're pulling up the picture, Babak, I really appreciate how you gave your narrative of how you proceeded with the case because you acknowledged that you made an attempt to perhaps do something laryngeal sparing. And of course, you have the benefit of doing the surgery and having the intraoperative feedback to know what you can and can't be advised to do in that situation, so. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I did everything I could to save the larynx, but um, you know, I figured out that functionally, I'm not gonna be happy and oncologically, I'm not gonna be happy, so. Just did the... Good point. All right, so. Can everybody see the screen? You just have stopped the uh, sharing. This one, how about now? Good, yeah. Okay, so this is the post-operative. So I had an iodine scan here as well, but for some reason it's not showing up. Anyway, post-operative iodine scan did not show any activity. Post-radioactive mm -hmm. iodine. post iodine blank radio screen. Yes, there was no lung or lymph in but not even a thyroglossal duct, not no activity. This is the post-operative, I think year number two or three, and you're looking at a uh, laryngectomy with thyroidectomy. This is a prosthesis. I'm not Maybe seeing any images. Oh, sorry again. Uh, let me see. How about now? Okay. Yes. All right. The CT scan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're looking at the CT scan. So this is the. Okay, this is laryngectomy on sagittal, and this is the apopharynx to esophagus and tracheostomy here, and this is the onaxial. You're looking at the surgical field, is beautiful. There is no recurrence. I mean, this is a non this is not just a hand scan, but there's no recurrence. Prosthesis is appropriately placed and. All clear. Okay. 
So the point was, you really, you know, don't write these guys off even when they come in with gigantic tumors and very aggressive. You definitely need to have a plan and adequate conversation and have everybody mention it. So there's a lot of planning. And done well, you know, there are, so I just checked this patient. He was just seen in April in our clinic at uh, Bellevue and he's still alive and he's still free of disease. Um, open for any further conversation before we get to Dr. Randall, please. Any other comments? Now, let me ask you, would you do external beam in these cases? Uh, Greg or Mike or Jeff? Yes, I would favor external beam. And there's a discussion about RAI versus external beam first, which Dr. Randolph touched upon earlier, but I would definitely favor external beam for these locally aggressive tumors. I definitely haven't been very impressed with external beam, but you know, this one. All right, so I'm gonna take over uh, to give the, the uh, control to Ayaka. Ayaka, are you online? Can you share yeah. your screen and stop uh, with us? Yep, just one second. Dr. Iwada is Dr. Randolph's fellow, and she's gonna be the, the inaugural fellow presenting at Tumor <laughs> Board. <laughs> All right. So, hello, I'm Ayaka. I'm currently um, in Boston with Dr. Randolph. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, uh, I know we're short on time, so I'll kind of go quickly through this, but we'll be discussing um, a case on recurrent differentiated thyroid cancer that we managed last week. Uh, so, this is a 61-year-old woman, no significant past medical history, who was diagnosed with papillary, with um, uh, thyroid cancer with lateral nodal mets in 2007. Uh, she initially saw an outside surgeon and underwent a total thyroidectomy, central neck dissection, and a right neck dissection. Um, the SCM and IJ were surgically removed, and then the case was complicated by injury to the right spinal accessory. And their pathology records had shown a four centimeter classical variant PTC extending through the capsule, two out of two positive central nodes, and 12 out of 15 lateral nodes. Um, she, at the time, she received 200 millicaries of RAI, uh, and the whole body scan showed uptake in the thyroid bed and a right retrosternal region. So she got a second dose, um, 150 RAI, um, and the following whole body scan now showed just substernal uptake, and then finally, the subsequent diagnostic scan um, was finally negative. So I also, in those scans, did you see any anatomic targets for those retrosternal uh, uptakes? Did you have yeah, like a well, scan or this anything was, that shows? This, this was, was so outside. This is her previous history. So Babak makes a very good point that in the setting of right paratracheal upper mediastinal uptake, you'd want to see what sort of anatomic correlate persisted four to six months after that RAI treatment dose, but this was prior to the patient being sent here. So we don't know, I think, Ayaka, correct me if I'm wrong, that there were any anatomic studies that were done at that time. Well, I'll get into it. Um, we did see it um, when, we, uh, when we ended up seeing her, but I don't think they decided at the time to really do anything about it surgically. Um, okay. But um, you'll see in a, in a few images what it looked like. So, um, so over the next few years, the TSH was kept suppressed. The thyroglobulin was in the two to three range consistently, but she did have on antibodies present, and they were steadily increasing over the years. It was initially 1.5 in 2008, which is after she got her first dose of RAI. It was 2.9 in 2011 after her second dose, and then 6.6 in 2013, and that was suggestive of biochemical recurrence. Um, and a neck and chest CT um, at that point showed a uh, 1.3 centimeter paratracheal lymph node, um, superior mediastinum, partly correlated to that previous REI scan, but it was had been seen since 2008. I mean, I had, and like I mentioned, it didn't take up iodine on the very last scan that she had. 
Um, so the lymph node was observed for the time being, given its stability, its tricky location, um, that could require a sternotomy or transthoracic approach. And the thyroid globulin was still in a two to three range, but the antibodies continued to increase. Um, and it went from 4.4, 2017, up to 17 a year later. And it's at this point that she was really referred. Um, to so what, one of the messages we wanted to bring to the fellows was that thyroid globulin is a very good marker, except if there are thyroid globulin antibodies. And in the presence of antibodies, the thyroid globulin, you will see this two to three is disproportionately lower and misleading um, based on the anatomic studies that you'll see in just a moment. And that's because of the presence of antibodies, but rising antibodies is a surrogate for progression of disease. Great. Um, so we got a scan at the time um, that I'll show you in a sec, but it showed an increase in the size of the right-paired tracheal adenopathy. It was now three centimeters, and there were a few one centimeter nodes above it. And she also had a few sub-centimeter long nodules that were too small to characterize, not necessarily indicative of or suspicious for malignancy. Um, so here are a few cuts, and I wanted to show you the lymph node of interest. Um, so the left uh, coronal cut there shows a nominate artery as it's coming off from the arch um, and going medial and superior to the lymph node. Uh, it's about two centimeters at this cut and then the superior vena cava uh, lateral to it. Um, the middle image here is now a few cuts posterior. You can see the cervical spine. And at this cut, it's, a, it's about at its maximum of three by three centimeters. Um, and then you've got the very right image, the axial section. And you can see it's adjacent to the arch and the trachea. And then laterally, you see it um, broadly surrounded by long corneal. Um, so as I've shown you, so the recurrence was closely associated with the great vessels the superior vena cava and the lung apex. Um, and uh, we obtained a consultation. Um, at this point, we'd like to ask the audience for suggestions to see what they would do at this point, what colleagues you would recruit for their expertise, if any. It's like a New England journal, a test was obtained, you know? So yeah. what consultation was obtained? I'm gonna consult Dr. Gavey to take care of the problem for me. <laughs> oh boy, I, that's kind of outside my expertise is in the chest. Is Dr. Chapey, I see. I, I, Don, are you still on the line? You have a tendency to operate in other parts of the body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so this, this, I mean, this patient needs a sternotomy, right? And you can do a mini sternotomy, so you could just do a manubriotomy and, um, there's two ways of doing it. You can do a manubriotomy and just basically put in the retractor and it'll break along the junction between the manubrium and the sternum. Or you can actually make a cut laterally as the thoracic surgeons prefer to do in Toronto. They make mm -hmm. a cut laterally out into an inner space and then it opens up a little easier. So obviously you'd open it to the left. Um, seems okay. resectable, so I think it's... It, it, well, it's yeah, it's so yeah, sorry, it's resectable, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these, these decisions, the consultation was obtained in the setting of a patient who had been followed for a long period of time and told everything is fine, your blood tests are not quite right. Mm -hmm. She was hesitant to accept the potential of an exploration that would include yeah. some form of sternal or clavicular head resection, as, uh, as Doug mentioned. And frankly, I was a little concerned that if this disease is aggressive and sticky, it's going to be all sticky over the lung apex and superior vena cava. The arch didn't concern me too much, but the venous anatomy down there and the lung apex made me concerned that it may not be pretty once I get in from a small hole from above. And so uh, those were all of the dynamics that led us uh, to the, uh, our consultation, which was uh, we already obtained a thoracics consultation. This was an additional consultation. Ayaka, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so we decided to come to our medical oncologist, actually, Dr. Lori Worth, um, who started her on oral lymphatinib. And I'll get into it a little bit more at the end, uh, but it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's been approved for treatment in recurrent radioiodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, and so five months later, uh, we got repeat imaging to reassess the size of the lymph node. So I'll show you a side-by-side -side comparison. This is an image I showed you from before in March, um, prior to the start of lymphatinib. 
Um, and here it is at the same level in September after treatment. And you can see the fantastic response. Oh, here wow. it is at three centimeters. And then here it's about 1.3 by two centimeters. Very um, nice. Yeah, and here's an axial as well. You can see prior to treatment, this is after, and then you can see the substantial um, decrease in size as well. Yeah, so at this point, much, looks much yeah, it looks <laughs> much more um, yeah, feasible. So we, at this point, we proceeded with the revision, um, right mediastinal transcervical dissection. Um, and we already had our CR thoracic colleague, so he was available for backup. Um, we started with a very low neck incision. We identified the right carotid. Um, common carotid, the vagus, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The IJ was already was previously resected, so as you can imagine, there was a lot of uh, dense. Scar. It was it was just a, it kind of we could approach what we thought was the stump of the jugular and see a couple of prolines towards its top. So we had a sense of where that is, but we didn't know how much of a nubbin that was relative to the subclavian. That, but but we were oriented, and it was primarily the anomalous artery that we were able to jump over and dissect caudally significantly. You know how a, a right subclavian artery will sometimes knuckle up high. We had the anomaly up in our neck and had significant dissection underneath it and below it uh, to access this area. Okay. Great. So luckily, um, the RLM was stimulated throughout the case. We dissected caudal or inferior to anominate. Um, and with and we had our thoracic um, surgeon colleague come in as well. Um, and at some point, we were retracting the nominant one way, the um, lung apex, another to get to the large um, lymph. Bed. Actually, this was this was not in an you know you you think you would follow the trachea and go down and you would find it as a paratracheal node. You know sometimes we see anthropsychotic nodes in that location. And uh, but this was actually as we came along the trachea, I reflected this with the lung laterally. And so I needed my thoracic surgeon to come and dissect it off the laterally reflected uh, lung, which he did very easily without any lung injury. But it, it wasn't in the position where I've normally been for nodes of this type. It was reflected laterally through my initial paratracheal dissection. This was a, this not, was not a true paratracheal, it was actually like a hyler. It was a for the posterior? I can just say I've never had an experience in this area where my initial, uh, where the x-rays showed this location and then it was reflected laterally uh, with the lungs. So I'm not clear. Uh, it behaved yeah. differently at surgery than a typical low paratracheal node, but this was really very low. Yeah, so the pathology showed uh, metastatic PTC, one out of seven nodes. Uh, that was 2.3 centimeters. The metastatic uh, focus was a little over one um, without any extra nodal infection. Um, and then the patient did really well postoperatively. Um, so you didn't need to do a, a sternotomy, correct? Correct. Wow. She actually had refused a sternotomy, so unless we were in an emergent situation when we required a sternotomy, if she really, um, said, I'd rather have you stop, abort the surgery, and then we can go with um, you know, other options like radiation therapy. So okay. we explained to her the setting of profuse bleeding, that would not remain an option. Sure. Did, did she have a post-op pneumothorax at all? She did not. Nice. Why would she have had that, Brendan? <laughs> Well, in your hands, wouldn't, but because you described something as fairly adherent. No, well, I think, I think it's like really, it's really, it's really important all live in this neck base area, but you've got revision surgery, a yeah. jugular stump, you've got disease yeah. that may be aggressive. Uh, it's uh, got a broad surface against the lung apex. It's got a bro you got to tell her about nerve resection. You got to tell her about potential sternotomy. Uh, and, and it was really very helpful to have the thoracic surgeon's fingers in there because he was able to palpate this laterally displaced node that my initial dissection had displaced laterally. So this is all about a team approach and working together. No, no question about it. All right. Uh, Ayaka, do you have more slides? Yeah, I um, just wanted to finish up. So I just wanted to briefly review lenvatinib. Um, orally administered multiple receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It selects kinase activities of VEGF receptors. Um, this is an inhibition 
pattern maps the human kinome here. Um, and it's been approved for the treatment of patients with locally recurrent or metastatic progressive radioiodine refractory um, differentiated thyroid cancer as a result of the SLOC trial. Um, the SLOC trial was a global, is randomized, double-blinded, and it shows significant improvement in your progression-free survival, as you can see in the image. Um, the mean survival was 18.3 months um, in the patients who received lumbatinib, and that's compared to the 3.6 months in those who received a placebo. The median time to response was two months only, which also uh, makes lumbatinib a good candidate for use um, as neoadjuvant therapy, um, which is how we had used it here. Um, and so this year, there'll be a phase two trial looking at oral lumbatinib and advanced thyroid cancer in the neoadjuvant setting um, and trying to see if there's an effect on the receptability of the disease. Um, and so be on the lookout for that um, and its results. Mm -hmm. And thanks okay. so much for uh, letting me present. Sure. Thank so, you, Leah. Great job. Questions. What about the uh, one? Excellent job. Yeah, at, well, at the end of the take, so I uh, thank you for doing that. At the end, we usually like to poll the attendings and share with us any points of any pearls of wisdom or others that you know you took out from this case presentation. This was fantastic. Um, any of the faculty who are online, if I didn't mention them by name, I just don't see all the attendings. So I see Dr. Farvel is back, and I think Dr. Chippe, I think Dr. Orloff left already, but. I would invite everybody to make a few comments regarding these cases. The one thing I would say is don't give up on thyroid patient, number one. Thyroid cancer is evolving. You have to be up to date. As you saw, the, the way Greg approached this case, that you know, maybe five, ten years ago, we would have done the thoracotomy. Now, with these medications, we change it. It's still, you have to be a good surgeon like Greg, like Doug, like uh, Mike, but we have these tools. So. And sometimes it pays to be aggressive on thyroid. So that's all I have, and uh, I would like to open for a discussion. So, Dr. Wada, I think that thank you for presenting a very interesting case. Um, you know, I, I presume during the workup, this was the sole site of residual disease, um, and I think a PET scan pre-treatment would help you identify any other REI refractory disease. You know, the concept of a neoadjuvant and that provides for um, borderline resectable lesions or challenging resectable lesions. Um, single site RA refractory recurrence is a very interesting concept. Um, you know, the problem with a lot of TKIs is that it's not Good. Stop. I'll take a new one. Thank you. So um, I think that the concept here of a phase two trial was for neoadjuvant levatinib for borderline resectable or challenging resectable lesions to shrink them as a part of a built-in strategy for surgery. Um, is a really good one. I was kind of curious for you would, that initially when I thought you were giving lenvatinib as a as a final decision, but I can see it now as a as a strategy for resection was a really great, uh, thoughtful way to approach it. So thank you for sharing this interesting case. Yeah. Hey Greg, what group is going to be sponsoring that le next lenvatinib trial? Uh, that'll be we're the primary center, Mass Eye and Mass General, and it'll also be opening up at MD Anderson and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Okay. okay. Uh, Mike and Dr. Farvel, is uh, Dr. Orloff, are you still on the line or you had to go? She had to check. She, hey, she hi. had to leave. I think she just oh, signed out. Yeah. yeah. One sec. Hello? Okay. Yeah, she had to leave. Okay. Uh, Mike, do you have any comments? No, I think it's all pretty much been covered. I mean, I think the the thoughtful description of the approach, finding you know in those instances the proximal vagus, using that and allowing you to then play defense when there's a um, threat. Some of our colleagues come in with uh, Bovi set on things that we can almost shoot light <laughs> bolt. So uh, that's a big part of it to make sure that uh, you know you're able to get the disease out and still maintain the function. Uh, yeah, absolutely, that, good uh, point. Very good point. Yeah, I'm sure Dr. Randolph was watching the the Bobby machine the entire time because yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's it, you know some friends come in with some advantages and some disadvantages. You know, and, and you're absolutely right that there's a there's a they they bring certain a certain uh, positive abilities to go a little lower if there's bleeding they're fine if there's a pneumothorax. They take care of it like it didn't happen, and but the bovi is a little high, so it's 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 somewhere between us all, you know, yeah, really uh, a team. Um, Good question, Greg? Dr. Randolph. Yeah. Uh, so you described a few pulmonary nodules as well. 
were they metastatic number one? No, we, we were un, we were unimpressed with those. I think Jeff's point of uh, sober uh, before any discrete high acuity local regional treatment to systemic event, PET scanning was was a very reasonable thought. Uh, we were comfortable that these were innocuous nodules and not part of our disease, and that kind of fit. I mean, we don't really have a TG that's worthwhile, but with the TG and antibody milieu that she was in, this would not be suggestive of pulmonary metastasis. I ask uh, Dr. Farvel and Dr. Chappé, any last comments? No, oh, just congratulations on a great conference. Thank you. Same with yeah, me. Yeah, Babak, I just really want to take one moment for thanking you so much for taking the time. The amount of time he invests in this to make it so streamlined and organized is uh, that benefit accrues to all of our fellows, and it's a lot of time and work, so we should all really thank him a lot. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Babak. This is for the uh, group effort. Uh, it's everybody, and this is for the society and for our patients above all. Uh, all right, so with that, we're gonna uh, finish. This was our last weekly conference. So starting uh, in two weeks, we're gonna go to bi-weekly conferences. Thank you all for taking the time, Dr. Zahn, to, for participating again. Thank all the faculty, Dr. Moore, Dr. Jeffrey Liu, Dr. Greg Randolph, Dr. Greg Farvel, our new guests this week. Hope we see you again. Dr. Chapeo for a repeat appearance. I'm sorry that I couldn't get to Dr. Orloff to talk, and uh, Arno, I think, is so busy. And all the other faculty, and then Dr. Randall Stack, and Dr. Randall from uh, uh, Endocrine Section. Please uh, give us feedback. Please let us know what we can do better. We hope that we continue these cases. This is for the fellows, this is for education, and hopefully we can be helpful. Stay safe, and I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.